its earliest days, America has been a nation on the move, pushing ahead, expanding, building up and tearing down, getting rid of the old and putting up the new. Our history has been one of enthusiastic vision and energetic growth. As a people, we thrived on change. But too often, the pattern of that change meant sacrificing whatever was old to create something entirely new. In our rush to the future, we began to lose valuable ties to the past. Ties that told us who we were, because they showed us where we came from. What we are today and what we will become tomorrow depend in large part on who we were yesterday. The identity of a place and of the people who live there is defined by its history. Because what sets one community apart from any other is the story of its past. A story told by its buildings and communities, its farms and its neighborhoods. This is the story of one state and how, in looking to its past, it has begun to define its future. Change has come to Georgia, and in many parts of the state, it has come quickly. Traditionally, growth here has been slow and restrained. Recently, though, Booms in population and development have brought more houses, more shopping centers, more schools and churches, more office buildings, all the structures that we as Americans require to support our way of life. Almost overnight, rural areas have been deserted and small towns have been transformed into suburbs. With the changes in landscape have come changes of lifestyle and people have been forced to adapt rapidly to their new surroundings. But in most places, people are willing to accept only so much change and no more. In Georgia, when communities began destroying the places that represented the most important parts of their history, people began to be concerned. With their concern came a movement of historic preservation, a movement that at times was no more than one person committed to fixing up one old house or storefront. But the movement grew, and today, Many people throughout the state are dedicated to preserving the best of the past as part of their planning for the future. Here, in the foothills of the North Georgia mountains, the people of Rome saw their downtown dying, and they decided to fight to keep it alive. The trees break and it opens up to reveal those buildings. And then when you look down Broad Street, the historic town center begins. So that's sort of the... They chose as the cornerstone of their program a plan to restore the town's main street to its original design. The committee has made a preliminary selection on the period light. When Broad Street was in its heyday, trees lined a grassy median that ran down the middle of the wide street. It was the center of community life then a place where business was transacted, deals were made, and gossip exchanged. But times changed. After World War II, suddenly everybody had a car. In towns throughout the country, shopping malls and suburban neighborhoods began to spring up, and people began moving away from downtown. The migration to the suburbs marked the beginning of the decline of many downtowns a decline which continued well into the 1970s. Then, in places like Rome, concerned citizens realized that as their downtowns disappeared, so did a big part of the history of their communities. They were losing the very features that made their town special and set them apart from other places around the country. I wouldn't touch it with a drop of paint. I really wouldn't. I think it would ruin the effect. And then they will be coming into the stairwell and there will be a security entrance. That's right, here, security entrance. Today, the signs of recovery are everywhere in Rome. Buildings are being renovated and businesses are moving back downtown. Like every other thriving American community, Rome has its suburbs and its shopping centers, but now it has a flourishing downtown as well.
In this country, we have a long and well-established heritage of change. From earliest times when we began carving a civilization out of the wilderness, we have been a nation of new beginnings. Unlike our European cousins, bound by centuries of tradition, our history stretched back only a few generations. We lived in a land of opportunity, a country where personal skills and abilities meant more than family history. We were a young nation, and we forged ahead with all the confidence of youth. We embraced the future and discarded the past with no regrets. Today, this heritage of change is still with us. We still live in a land of opportunity and growth, but we have a history now. We have roots, roots represented by what's called the built environment, the houses and shops and offices that make up our neighborhoods and commercial districts. These roots are clearly seen in Savannah, Georgia's oldest city. When James Oglethorpe arrived in the new colony in 1733, he designed a city of parks, one where houses, churches, and shops lined a series of open squares. These squares served as gathering places and as the center of community life. Today, they give Savannah the distinctive and somewhat European look that sets it apart from other Georgia cities. Through the years, Savannah's fortunes shifted with the times. During the Civil War, the city survived intact. But after the war, like many towns of the Deep South, Savannah was poor. Too poor to tear down its old buildings and replace them with new ones. Many of its downtown buildings fell into disrepair. But it wasn't until the 1950s that the city faced the first real threat to its heritage. Then, one of its most beautiful squares was destroyed to make room for a parking deck. When this happened, a group of citizens mobilized to form what would become one of the country's most successful preservation programs. Since then, more than 2,000 historic structures have been saved. One of the city's most notable efforts lies along its riverfront. Here, a revitalization of the entire area restored the traditional link between the town and the river. From earliest days, the Savannah River was the lifeblood of the city. Beginning in the 18th century, trading ships from many destinations brought goods in and out of the port here. At Factor's Walk, on a bluff overlooking the river, Fortunes were made as cotton was bought and sold. Today, the buildings that once housed offices for merchants and cotton brokers are filled with restaurants and boutiques, and historic Savannah attracts visitors from around the world. Preservation is big business in Savannah because each year, tourism generates more than $200 million in revenue for the city. But preservation in Savannah isn't only for the tourists. Here, it really begins with the children. How many years? All right. Now, this morning, we're going to think about terracotta buildings. Savannah's commitment to preservation extends into its schools, where heritage education is part of the regular curriculum. Looking at our beautiful city. The heritage program here was one of the first in the country and it has become a model for other programs. It offers students the chance to learn firsthand about the history and architecture that surround them. You're going to take care of your city, and you're going to love it. When the fence was put down, the city of Savannah had to pay $44 for it. But that was a long time ago. But isn't it beautiful? It's Wickersham's Iron. Now, I told you that that round window it's called an ox eye window. When you have found Persephone, please put your hands up. Oh, very good. But even now, as our children come to appreciate the past, and even as we instill in them a greater understanding of the history of their own communities, we are faced almost daily with decisions about what to preserve 
and what to replace. Nowhere is this dilemma more evident than in Atlanta. Atlanta has always been a city of the new. Since the Civil War, the philosophy here has been one of building and rebuilding, of pulling down the old to put up the new, of forging ahead to create a brave new city that mirrored the vibrant enthusiasm of a growing metropolitan area. This tradition continues today, as old buildings disappear to make way for new skyscrapers, and residential areas are replaced by commercial development. To many people, Atlanta's building boom is the ultimate symbol of progress, and one to be encouraged at any cost. Other people, though, point to the city's past as the only thing that sets it apart from any other growing metropolitan area. Landmarks like the Fox Theater, for example, once destined to be destroyed, but saved by a massive citizen's effort. Older neighborhoods like Candler Park and Inman Park, with their Victorian homes that represent a different, younger Atlanta. Downtown office buildings, once as modern as the city they represented, and now a reminder of how this city has grown. All of these buildings are a legacy left to us by our parents and our grandparents and our great-grandparents. They represent the dreams and accomplishments of an earlier time. And they show us the patterns of change that have made our communities what they are today. On the coastal islands, these patterns of change are plainly seen. As more and more tourists flock to the coast, many resort areas are rushing to build new hotels and condominiums. A few, though, are preserving the remnants of an earlier time. This rambling, elegant old hotel reflects the spirit of a time when the rich were very rich. This was the showpiece of the Jekyll Island Club, a club that attracted some of the country's richest and most powerful men. The membership roster read like a listing from who's who. The Rockefellers, Goodyears, Pulitzers, and Vanderbilts were but a few of the prominent families who gathered on Jekyll Island each winter. They enjoyed a luxurious lifestyle here. Lawn parties, picnics on the beach, and hunting expeditions filled much of their days. In the evenings, they gathered at the clubhouse, the hub of social life on the island. The club flourished for more than 50 years, but in the 1930s, the strain of the Great Depression began to take its toll. And in the 1940s, the pressures of World War II dealt the club its final blow. The 1942 season was the last, and the club never reopened after the war. As the years passed, the forces of wind and rain and the corrosive salt air did their damage. Ceilings began to cave in, and walls began to fall down. The elegant rooms, littered with debris, became no more than dilapidated reminders of their glorious past. The old hotel, once as pampered and well looked after as its guests, seemed doomed to fall apart piece by neglected piece. It was saved in 1986, when a consortium of businessmen and developers set out to rescue the majestic old building and turn it into a new hotel. They began a massive rehabilitation of the historic property, a project that would require millions of dollars and more than a year of intensive work. With great care, they recreated much of the fine craftsmanship and the dedication to detail that was so much a part of the original structure. And as they restored the building, they also recaptured some of the history of a vanished era. When an old building no longer needs to function in its original role, 
it often can be adapted to fill a new need. This building, for example, once housed an elementary school. Today, the children are gone, and so are the classrooms. But in their place are offices. Throughout the state, other structures offer other examples of adaptive use. In Savannah, for instance, the old armor housing for troops now contains college classrooms. And across the street, one of the city's oldest drugstores serves as the campus restaurant and bookstore. In Columbus, an ironworks that once supplied the entire region with cast iron goods has been converted into a convention center. And in Thomasville, one of the first consolidated schools in the southern part of the state has been restored as a thriving cultural center. As we look to the past and try to decide what we consider worth saving, we must ask ourselves the question, why preserve? One of the earliest motives was patriotism, a motive clearly seen in the preservation of places like Mount Vernon. In 1853, when rumors began circulating that George Washington's home was being considered for the site of a new hotel, neither the United States government nor the state of Virginia could raise the funds to purchase it. Miss Anne Pamela Cunningham, a private citizen from South Carolina, mobilized a group of women and they collected $200,000 to buy the house and 200 surrounding acres. This was the first organized preservation effort in this country and the women succeeded where the governments had failed. The earliest preservation efforts in this country concentrated on structures that had specific historic associations. But in 1919, when New England resident William Sumner Appleton founded the Society for the Preservation of New England Antiquities, he set forth the idea that many historic buildings were worthy of preservation, not because of what had occurred within their walls, but because of their architectural significance. The craftsmanship found in historic structures and the variety of design, scale, size, textures, and ornamentation reflect the diversity of our heritage. Places like Macon's Hay House, for instance, or Atlanta's Swan House, are excellent examples of outstanding structures worthy of preservation simply because of their unique architectural qualities. Another motive for preservation is economics. Rehabilitation of old buildings creates jobs, and jobs create income that is reinvested in the community. Restored buildings go back on the tax rolls. Revitalized commercial districts attract new businesses, and they in turn contribute to the tax base of a community. Historic areas generate tourism, and tourist dollars can stimulate the economy of a struggling community. Historic areas contribute to an improved quality of life by encouraging the revitalization of the places we live and work and raise our families. Because historic structures help us understand our past, they instill in us what is known as a sense of place, a sense of identity for our communities and for ourselves. By rooting us firmly in the past, they provide a foundation for our communities to build on. And by promoting a sense of pride and of true community spirit, they help create a strong sense of place. Through the years, the philosophy of historic preservation evolved beyond the idea of simply saving individual buildings. This concept has taken root, and preservation today extends beyond individual buildings to include entire historic areas or districts. In Atlanta, for instance, just around the corner from some of the newest, tallest buildings in the city lie both the Sweet Auburn and the Martin Luther King Historic Districts. Time has taken its toll here, and the evidence of years of neglect is easy to spot. But Auburn Avenue once was the heart of Atlanta's proudest black neighborhood. Here, 
Martin Luther King Jr. was born and reared. Here, most of the black-owned and operated businesses in the city were located. Here was the famous Royal Peacock Nightclub, once as well known as any club in Harlem. Here stood the churches that were, and still are, the center of life in the black community. Auburn Avenue tells the story of a part of our history that is often ignored and easily forgotten. But in Georgia, preservation tells the story of many such groups, each with its own unique culture. From black to white, from inner city to remote farm, from the richest of towns to the poorest of communities, it's the variety of people and the stories of their past that make Georgia's heritage unique. In places like the Sautee and Nakuchi Valleys in the mountains of North Georgia, rural preservation offers its own set of challenges. Nowhere are the traditional values that represent the heritage of this country more firmly established than in the rural parts of the state. Growth here has been slow, and change has been a long time coming. In most rural areas, land use traditionally has been governed by agricultural requirements. Broad open vistas were created when the most productive areas were set aside for crops and cattle. Houses were placed outside these wide, undeveloped fields. Because the look of the landscape was dictated by the needs of the people, it is an important part of the heritage of the area. In rural areas, decisions about preservation often are tough ones, and many of these areas consider preservation a luxury they can't afford. But the history of this nation is one of potatoes and peanuts, of cows and cotton, of successful plantations and failing dirt farms. Much of our heritage is found in these rural areas, and it's a heritage we can't afford to lose. Preservation here can be used as a tool to help plan for the future, a future that encourages growth without destroying important ties to the past. In a time when growth and change often mean the difference between prosperity and poverty, holding on to the best parts of the past doesn't necessarily mean holding out against progress. In the heart of quail country in South Georgia, the people of Thomasville have seen preservation bring progress to their town. In the late 1800s, Thomasville was a popular winter vacation spot for wealthy northerners. Each year, the tourists came here to enjoy the mild weather. They lived in grand Victorian structures that served as their winter homes. At that time, when most of the South was still recovering from the Civil War and from Reconstruction, the money the northern tourists brought south bolstered Thomasville's economy. Through the years, though, Thomasville's fine old buildings came to be taken for granted. And in 1968, the town's Victorian Gothic library was torn down and a parking lot put in its place. Suddenly, the people of Thomasville realized that despite what had been saved through the years, they were on the verge of losing many of the things that made their town a special place to live. A small group of citizens banded together to form what would become one of the state's most effective preservation organizations. Historic preservation means different things to different people. In St. Mary's, a coastal fishing village, it means carrying on the traditions of generations of shrimping families. In the small community of Guyton, it means a Christmas celebration where residents open their historic homes to tourists from around the country. In the tiny town of Plains, it means remembering a former president and the place he grew up. Historic structures are tangible reminders of our history, and they are part of the legacy we inherit from those who came before us. These places, 
and the memories they represent are a vital part of our neighborhoods and our communities. And they are important, not just because they are old, but because they contain so much of ourselves. They provide us with a sense of continuity. And by telling us the story of our past, they show us where we came from and help us understand where we're going. They point the way to a future that builds on the solid foundation of the past. A future that takes the best of the old and combines it with the new to create the traditions of today. These traditions are the legacy we will leave behind. And it will be up to the generations that follow to decide which parts of our history deserve to be remembered. What is new today will be old tomorrow. And the houses and neighborhoods and communities that make up our lives will be judged by our children and our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren. If we are to hope they judge them kindly and make wise decisions about which parts of our history to save, we must leave them a good example to follow. We must leave behind a commitment to the thoughtful preservation of the best of the past. If we do, we will have fulfilled our obligation to those who came before us and to those who will come after. information about historic preservation programs or historic sites operated by the state of Georgia, contact the Department of Natural Resources.